We're going to be looking at scriptures in the book of Hebrews, book of 1 Peter, book of 1 John, book of John, that is the gospel of John. Um, and there's going to be some other things that I kind of refer to, but we're going to be looking at and focusing on those scriptures in particular. And today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about what we believe about Jesus' work for our salvation. I couldn't put that on the screen because that was a little bit too long of a title, but really we're going to be looking at what Jesus has done for our salvation. Now what we've been looking at in the weeks prior has just simply been what we believe. And of course the things that we have looked at, the things that we will look at, are not a complete look, list of what we believe. I mean to do that we would just simply say, okay, we're starting in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to Revelation, you know, so it doesn't really quite work out that way. But as far as to just simply, you know, have a, 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 a list of some of the main things that we believe, um, that's what we've been talking about. And I think probably one of the biggest things, one of the mainest things that we should talk about is just simply what Jesus has done for us on the cross and the work that He's provided for us for our salvation. Now, this is what um, is um, in the, the ABA doctrinal statement. This is a good doctrinal statement. This is what we're going to start out with today. And that is, we believe that the suffering death of Jesus Christ was substitutionary for all mankind is, and is efficacious only for those who believe. Okay? And so, um, that's you know, pretty much it. Now, in that we're going to be looking at really four different words. Maybe it's not necessarily in that statement, but those are the four words that we're going to be looking at. Number one, we're going to be talking about the work that Jesus has done on the cross. Okay. Number two, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about how that work was substitutionary. Number three, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at how it is universal how it applies to all of mankind. And then last but not least, we're going to be looking at how it is efficacious. I know I'm going to mess that word up at some point today. Efficacious for those who believe, all right? So, jumping into it, let's simply talk about the very first one, and that is the work that Jesus did. And What work are we talking about? Because when you think about it, um, Jesus did a whole bunch of different things, didn't he? I mean, you know, when you think about what Jesus did on the earth and what people look and, and think about Jesus' work, I mean, when you go and you probably poll a lot of different people, then you say, what did Jesus do? What was Jesus' work? They're probably going to say, oh, well, well, he went and he healed people. And he did. Or they're going to say, oh, well, Jesus went and performed miracles. He turned water into wine. He, he walked on the water, which he did, right? And so when you think about the work of Jesus Christ and the things that Jesus did, some people may say, oh, well, he went around preaching and he went around being a good teacher, which he did. Jesus did all of those things. But we need to understand that the work of Jesus Christ was not those things. Instead, the work that Jesus Christ came to do was to lay down his life as a sacrifice for the sins of all humanity. Now, all of those other works that he did actually pointed to that one thing, okay? And so the miracles that he performed, all of the healing, all of the things, the changing the water into wine, the walking on, on the water, all of those miracles that he did was to point to the fact that he really was the Messiah and it was necessary for him to be the Messiah in order to go to the cross. So all the teaching that he did was there to prepare people so that they could accept him and accept what he did for them on the cross. So everything that Jesus did was there to prepare himself for that one thing. All the things that Jesus did as far as being a good person was there to fulfill the law and it was necessary for him to fulfill the law in order to be the sacrifice. So when we talk about the work that Jesus did on the cross, we really need to, to understand that what we're talking about is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is, that He willingly went to the cross and died on the cross, that He was buried and on the third day He arose, and then after that, He then rose for the Father. But the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is that work that God sent Jesus to perform in order to uh, provide us with our salvation. Now, <clears throat> In the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, you remember that John the Baptist came and said, Behold, the Lamb of God 
that takes away the sins of the world. And so before Jesus began His earthly ministry, doing all of those things that were to point to who He was and then go to the cross, before He began all of that, John the Baptist was there identifying Jesus Christ. And the identification that John the Baptist gave to Jesus was, you are the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb of God. And so we think about Jesus being the Lamb of God, we need to kind of take a little bit of a step further and understand that by being the Lamb of God, that was much more than just simply being a, a cute little fluffy, fuzzy animal, right? You know, the Lamb of God, oh, he is so cute and fuzzy and fluffy. That's kind of what we think of. But really, it's, it's, it's much more than that. Instead, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, he was referring to the fact that Jesus Christ was that sacrifice. And then later we see in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 is that Peter said that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from the vain, empty ways of your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ who is unblemished and unspotted. And so it is that blood of Jesus Christ what Jesus has done for us on the cross that has provided for our salvation. And this was something, that sacrifice, was something that was very necessary. It was something that God the Father wanted to happen. Now, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 10, we see a little bit about what that sacrifice on the cross was all about. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. Now, in the first couple of verses before this, we see that he's just simply talking about all the sacrifices that went on in the Old Testament and how those sacrifices really weren't there to do anything important for anybody other than to just simply be a reminder for sins. And so it didn't take away sin. It didn't do anything to solve sin. It was something that was incomplete. And really the purpose was there to remind people of the, the coming sacrifice. And so you notice in verse number five, it says, Wherefore, when the Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Now, this is a couple of different Old Testament quotations. And these Old Testament quotations are a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And I want you to see that as far as these offerings and these sacrifices go, that this is something that even though God wanted the offerings and the sacrifices, it was something that God didn't necessarily want. It wasn't something that was going to do anything to solve any problems as far as sin was concerned. But instead, what God wanted and what God happened is you notice that it says there in verse number five, a body you prepared for me. And so when we think about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ was sent to this world to do, and you know, we looked before about how Jesus Christ is God the Son, and so He existed all since eternity past. <laughs> but when He came to this earth, he came there in that body, in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was not sinful, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so that body that was prepared for him was something that was of the Father, was something that, that God wanted to happen. As a matter of fact, you know, we look at, at the Bible, we see that Jesus Christ was as a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. This was all plan, uh, planned out well in advance of all of this. And so when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he had something to do, and that is to be this sacrifice. And you notice what Jesus did in verse number seven. It says, here I am. I have come to do your will, O God. And so Jesus Christ in the purpose of what he was there to do was to be that sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And when we go down to verse number 10, we see what all of that is about. In verse number 10, it says, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so here is God wanting that sacrifice to take place. And here is Jesus performing that work of the sacrifice 
to take place. And because of that sacrifice, we have been made holy. You know, when you think about work for salvation, and there is work for salvation that has to be done. But the work for salvation doesn't have to be done on your part or my part or any of our parts. That can't happen because we're dead in trespasses and sins. But the work for salvation did happen with what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that work that happened for salvation is something that is, 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 is good. It's valid. As a matter of fact, what it says here, that this sacrifice for the body of Christ is, is done something once for all. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we have that sac uh, salvation, then we have salvation for eternity. It is the sacrifices for once for all, and we have been made holy once for all. You know, there's a lot of times that people will go through life thinking about work and what do I need to do to be saved? How can I secure my eternity? How can I make sure that everything is fine? How can I, you know, it, 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 am I going to worry about messing up one day and making a mistake? You know, the work that Jesus Christ has done for us is something that is complete. And I guess that should actually be another word in here, right? You know, along with substitutionary and a universal and efficacious. Man, that's three times in a row I've said it okay. Um, but, but complete needs to be in there as well. You know, and that is that what Jesus Christ has done for us, He has done for us. And so if you think, well, you know what, I know if I, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I just, I just don't know, I just don't feel like that's good enough. I, I feel like I need to do something else. I feel like I need to, um, you know, go on and, 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 and do these religious works and do these religious acts. But I'm here to tell you, in fact, verse 10 is here to tell you that what Jesus Christ has done for you is sufficient. It was something that the Father wanted. It was something that the Son did. And because the Father wanted it, because the Son did it, that sacrifice is something that has made us holy. And God's the one that considers people holy God's the one that considers people not holy. And if God says you're holy, then you are holy. And it's something that is once for all. So if you're thinking, you know, I need to go on, I need to do these religious works, I need to, to, to be in church, I need to do these good deeds, I need to do all of these things, then really you're fretting over things that you don't need to fret about because the work of Jesus Christ is enough. Now, this work that Jesus did was substitutionary. And by substitutionary, I mean it's a substitute. Jesus came and he was a substitute for us. And so there was something that we needed to have and uh, uh, Jesus came and took that upon himself so that we didn't have it. And likewise, what happens is that we get something from Jesus that we don't deserve, which is grace and salvation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, to start out with, we need to understand what we really were entitled to. What, we, what was due us as far as being a sinner? Well, if you remember when God created Adam and then God created Eve, He told them you can eat of all the, the, the fruit from the trees all around the garden, but the tree that is in the middle of the garden, He said, you will not eat thereof because the day thou eatest thereof, you will surely die. So God said, and here was God's rule for Adam and Eve, God's law, you can eat from all the trees except for that one tree. You eat that one tree, then the penalty for doing that is going to be death, right? And so because of that, we see, as a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we see that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is everlasting life. But the wages of sin is death. And so when you think about here is sin, and what is going to be the penalty of sin, the penalty of sin is going to be death. And so if the penalty for our sin is death, then don't you see why Jesus had to come and he had to die in order to take that penalty? So let's take a look <clears throat> at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18, it simply says this. 
<clears throat> it says, verse number 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. So when we look at this, can't you see the substitution that takes place? And that is that we see, first of all, that Christ died for sins. I mean, there is that sacrifice that's taken place. But the reason why that sacrifice takes place is to be a substitute. And what happens is that Jesus Christ, who is righteous, is put to death for the people who are unrighteous. So if you think back to the penalty, if the penalty of, of sin is death, why did Jesus have to die? Because he didn't commit any sin. All the things that Jesus did was perfectly in the will of the Father. You know, everybody else sins. You, you sin, I sin, we all sin. But the only one who has ever walked on the face of this earth who has not sinned was Jesus Christ. And so, did Jesus have to die? Well, he didn't have to die in terms of the fact that he was not a sinner. It was not something that was due him. It was something that was, he, he willingly gave as a sacrifice and as a substitution for us who are sinners and we are unrighteous and death is part of us. I mean, when you look at life, death is part of it. And that's just simply the way it is. And then after death, we've got judgment. And so here we have Jesus Christ being a substitute for us. And this substitution gives us something of Jesus. And also, Jesus takes away something of ours. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. This is actually one of my favorite verses in the, uh, the Bible because it just it explains things so well. In chapter 5 and verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so there is an exchange that takes place. Here we've got Jesus Christ, where it says here, who knew no sin. And so as we've been saying before, here's Jesus. He is qualified to be our sacrifice because he is perfect in all of his ways. He doesn't have any sin. He doesn't deserve to die. He doesn't deserve any judgment. But what he does is because of that willing substitution, that willing sacrifice, you notice that it says here, God made him to be, uh, who had no sin, to be sin for us. And so when Jesus Christ was on Calvary's cross and he was being that substitution for us, what happens is God takes the sins of the entire world and he puts them on Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he was on the cross, if you recall, the earth went dark. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I believe that the reason why it went dark is because God forsook Jesus. And the reason why God forsook Jesus, the Father forsook the Son, is because all of the world's sins were placed upon Jesus and God can't look on sin. And so the darkness was showing it. And you think about the suffering of Jesus. You think about the physical suffering of Jesus, which was incredibly immense. But you think about the spiritual suffering and the emotional suffering of Jesus as well. You know, there is physical pain and there is emotional pain. And one of the greatest emotional pains that there is, is just simply being lonely. Here Jesus has been in constant contact, in constant fellowship with the Father all through his existence, really. But at this moment, as he is taking sin and the sins of the world upon himself, all of a sudden, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? So think about not only the physical suffering of Jesus, but think about the spiritual suffering of Jesus and the emotional suffering of Jesus. As far as the spiritual suffering of Jesus, you know, we've all had times where we've done something and we felt guilt. 
And that guilt is something that can be a very heavy weight and a very heavy burden. Imagine all the world's sins placed on Jesus at that one moment. So here is God who made Jesus, who didn't know, didn't have any sin to be sin for us. Why? Well, because it says here, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus takes our sin and we, don't, we take His righteousness. It is not a fair trade. It is something that is done entirely and wholly out of the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Isn't it simply incredible? Now, Jesus and the work that He did was not only substitutionary, but it was also universal. What does that mean? Well, just simply asking the question, whose place did Jesus take? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Did He die on the cross only for a select few people, or did He die on the cross for everyone? Well, what we can see from the Bible is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for everyone. And you say, okay, what, what, how do you say that? Well, first of all, um, we go to 2 Peter chapter 2, or uh, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse number 9, and we see that first of all, um, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but instead He wants everyone, all men, to come to repentance through Him starting out, right? And so when we talk about Jesus Christ and His sacrifice being for everyone, we need to understand that first of all, the Father that uh, planned all of this out, and it was the will for the Son to go and sacrifice His life, that the Father does not want anybody to perish. The Father doesn't want anybody in hell. The Father wants everybody to repent. The Father wants everyone to be saved, right? So if the Father wants that, why would the Father only allow a few certain people to have that sacrifice applied to them, all right? Now, let's take a look at the book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2, we see that it says this. It says, He is our atoning sacrifice, or He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay? So when Jesus Christ was on the cross, and He was making that sacrifice there, it wasn't just simply for our sins. It was for the sins of everyone. And so when you think about everyone's sins, that's a pretty big thing, isn't it? You think about all the terrible people, the awful people that have ever existed on this earth. You take Adolf Hitler. You take all the, the, the Roman emperors. You take all the despots. You take all the, the cruel, horrible things that people have done. And yet, when Jesus was on the cross, He was the atoning sacrifice for every single one of those sins. So what does that mean? Well, what it just simply means is this, that anybody can be saved. There may be some people, and I think there are some people out in the world today, that think that they have done something that is so bad and so horrible that there is no way, no way at all, that God could forgive them of their sins. But why not? If we were to take that approach, wouldn't we be putting limitations on God? God who has created the heavens and the earth can do anything. So as far as forgiving the sins of the world and therefore forgiving something that, that you've done, that I've done, that somebody else has done, not forgiving, not being able to forgive them is off the table because God can do anything, right? The question is, would God do something like that? Well, if He wants everybody to repent and come to Him, then wouldn't He be able to supply the salvation for everybody? Anybody can be saved. You say, well, you know, I, I, I've, I've done some things that are too terrible. Well, you look at people in the Bible and you see that um, there's murderers that have been saved. 
There's people who are criminals, robbers who have been saved. There's people who are blasphemers that's been saved. There's all kinds of people in the Bible who have been saved because God has applied the sacrifice of Jesus Christ across the board. It is universal. But just because anybody can be saved, that is different than saying that everybody will be saved. And that brings us up to our last point. And our last point is just simply this. Jesus' work is only effective. I guess I didn't have to word, use that word. Um, what was it? Effect, uh, effectacious. See, I told you I'd get it wrong. Okay. It's only made effective to those people who believe. And you say, okay, well, how is that? Well, let's take a look at a very important um, passage of Scripture, very familiar passage of Scripture, John chapter 3 and verse number 16. You know, a lot of people know John chapter 3 and verse number 16. I think that people also need to know John chapter 3 and verse 17 and John chapter 3 and verse 18 and along with all the other ones too. But John chapter 3 and verse 16, 17, and 18 really all go together very well, okay? So you notice, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not son, send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So stopping right there, we kind of get a little bit of a summary of what we've been talking about, right? And that is, here is Jesus Christ being sent into the world through God the Father. God gave His Son, and so here is this sacrifice that is coming. And this sacrifice is something that's going to be a substitution for everyone, and God so loved the world, the whole world, everybody in the world, that everybody is part of that thing. And that is that in verse number 17, that God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come here to go and judge the world. Now, that is going to happen later when He returns. But for the first coming, Jesus was saying, God doesn't send the Son to the, into the world to condemn it. But notice in verse number 18, it does say this, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so when we look at this, it really just kind of separates it very well, doesn't it? And that is that, yes, God has applied salvation across the board so that anybody can have it, but it's not going to be applied as far of as an effectacious point of view. It's not going to, to do its intended effect. It's not going to be made effective unless somebody believes. And so, whoever believes is what Jesus said is not condemned. And why is that? Well, because when you look at it, you see, well, you know, God sent Jesus to be the sacrifice. What God wants for people is God wants people to accept Him and to accept that sacrifice. So when God accept, or when people accept the sacrifice that God gives, then there is no condemnation there because the righteousness that Jesus had is applied to us and the sin that we have has gone over to Jesus Christ or because the sin that we've had applied uh, gone over to Jesus Christ. And we have been made holy once for all because of that sacrifice. So whoever believes is not condemned. You say, well, you know what? I, I've, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but yet I've backslidden. Okay, well, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if Jesus can't sin, He can't tell a lie, and He just said that whoever believes in Me is not condemned. So if you have truly believed in Him, if you have truly accepted Him as your Savior, then you are not condemned. But I, I, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand. Well, okay, I don't, but I do understand this. And when we understand this, don't you see how we can have peace and how we can have rest? But on the other hand, you notice what it also says, and that is, it says, whoever 
does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so on the other hand, if somebody has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, then they have not had that sacrifice applied to them. And if they haven't had that sacrifice applied to them, then they don't have the forgiveness that comes from that sacrifice. And if they don't have that forgiveness, then they stand condemned already. And the proof of it is that they haven't believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so, if we believe in Jesus, we're going to heaven. If somebody does not believe in Jesus, then I hate to say it, but they're going to hell. And that sounds horrible. And it is horrible when you think about it, but it is also true. You know, I was um, getting on Facebook the other day, and by the way, I, I don't get on Facebook a lot, you know. If you think, oh, I put something on Facebook and uh, Brother Steve is going to see it, I probably won't because I'm not a Facebook junkie. To tell you the truth, I only get, if, if I get on Facebook five minutes a day, I've splurged, okay? And I only get on it pretty much to see if there's anything that comes through the church's uh, Facebook page, number one. And number two, because Simon's here, you know, I'm seeing if Chloe's posted a really cute picture because I like looking at those. But, you know, you go, you, you open up Facebook and you're sitting there scrolling and it's just, you know, this video, this video. Oh, here's this guy who's digging a swimming pool in the jungle. Oh, that's pretty cool. And you keep on going, right? You know, and so I was just sitting there going through it and I noticed this guy, you know, and he's, he's like having a conversation with some guy in his, in his car and it's got little subtitles there because you don't have the sound that's coming through. And it says something like, would a good God send someone to hell? And so, you know, it kind of caught my attention. I'm sitting there reading the subtitles of what this guy's saying. I'm like, hey, this guy's got a, a pretty good point. And he's like, you know, it, it's not that God sends you to hell. It's that you do it all on your own. He says it's kind of like somebody who's on a ship and the ship is sinking. And God comes and gives you a lifeboat. You can get in the lifeboat or you can stay on the ship. If you get in the lifeboat, then you're saved. If you stay in the ship, then it's not God's fault. And it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, here we've got a sinking ship called life. And we can complain and we can say it's not fair and we can say that it's not right and we can moan and groan or we can just simply say, where's the lifeboat? You know, let's get off the boat, the sinking ship, and let's get in the lifeboat. Jesus Christ, because God has loved us enough that He has taken His one and only Son and given Him to us as a substitution. He's given it to everybody. Anybody can be saved. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background is. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter anything. If you are a person, if you exist on this planet, then you can be saved. But the only way that you can be saved, the only way that you can have that sacrifice applied to you is when you believe in Jesus. And believing in Jesus is not just simply saying, oh, well, Jesus existed. It's not just simply saying, oh, well, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. There's a lot of people who think that believing in Jesus is just an acknowledgement of certain facts in religion. It's not about that. It's about understanding what Jesus has done for us and being willing to getting off the sinking ship and into the lifeboat. It's about being willing to say, what Jesus has done for me is my salvation. I am a sinner, I need salvation, and what Jesus has performed on the cross for my sins is it. And when we believe that and we trust that, that's believing on Jesus. And when we believe on Jesus, then we have that sacrifice that God the Father made for us 2,000 years ago. We have that sacrifice applied to us. And when we have that sacrifice applied to us, then we have salvation given to us. And when we have salvation given to us, 
then we can rest. So, the question is this. What do you believe about Jesus' work? Do you believe that Jesus was a good man? He was. Do you believe that Jesus performed miracles? He did. But that's not the work that Jesus was sent to do. Jesus was sent to be that sacrifice for you and that sacrifice for me. And we can accept it or we can reject it. If we accept it, we're great. If we reject it, we're awful, well, terrible. <laughs> we're in a bad position, right? Okay. But what are we going to do? Have you accepted that sacrifice of Jesus Christ? If you haven't, then believe that Jesus was the Savior that the Father sent and that we can have salvation if we will just simply trust that God will forgive us when we go to Him and we ask Him to save us. When we go and we acknowledge that Jesus Christ lived for us and died for us and was resurrected for us and that Jesus Christ is our Lord, then we have that salvation. And if we have that, if, if God has saved us, then we don't have to worry about dotting the I's. We don't have to worry about crossing the T's. We don't have to worry about completing what God has started because God has completed everything already. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we have rest. When we realize, oh, what God has done for us is, is it. It's complete. There's nothing more to do. We, we believe in Jesus, so we have it. When we come to that point, then maybe we can worry about things in life. Maybe we can worry about, you know, family. Maybe we can worry about finances. Maybe we can worry about different things of what's going to happen at work tomorrow. We can worry about all of those different things. We shouldn't, but we can. We do. But the one thing that we should never worry about is our eternity. Because salvation is not in our hands. It's in God's hands. He's done the work. We just simply accept it by faith or we reject it in unbelief. And that's all there is to it. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the time that we have spent in your word this morning. Lord, I ask that you would please help us to understand what you've done for us. And um, for those of us who have accepted your sacrifice, Lord, please uh, help us to rest in the knowledge that, uh, that you love us, that you've given us righteousness and holiness, and that you're one day going to receive us to yourself. And Lord, we ask that um, for those people who haven't accepted you as their Savior, I ask that you would convict them of their sins, enlighten them, and help them to see what you've done for them on the cross. And, Help them to know what it is to believe in you. Lord, please uh, forgive us of our sins and please be with us as we continue to worship you this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.